This is an interview with Steve Cutler, taken at the New York offices of Simpson Thatcher for the SEC Historical Society on December 6, 2018. So what we like to do to start off is get a sense of your background. So if you could talk, perhaps tell us a little bit about where you grew up, where you went to school. Uh, I grew up in Los Angeles. Uh, I ended up going to college uh, on the East Coast at Yale. I stayed at Yale for law school. Uh, after law school, I went back to the West Coast, uh, first to clerk for a judge on the Ninth Circuit, Dorothy Nelson, mm -hmm. uh, and then to work for a public interest group called the Center for Law and the Public Interest. Okay. What drew you to law school? Uh, I guess my friends would say uh, I was always going to go to law school. Both of my parents had uh, gone to law school and were practicing lawyers. Um, and I just think I always, um, I probably had a predisposition to uh, legal analysis and the like. So, When you were in law school, did you have any special interest in securities, which obviously your career eventually led you to, or did what did you study? Because it's interesting that you went to law school, clerked, and then spent a year in public interest law. Right. Um, uh, the answer is no. I never took securities regulation. Um, I may have taken, I think I took sort of the requisite corporations class. Um, I think in law school, if you had asked me, <clears throat> could you imagine practicing in the securities regulatory arena, I would have said no. Um, I had, when I was in college, I'd spent a summer working uh, on Wall Street, and at that time I sort of, I, I had thought about, hey, do I want to go to business school, do I want to go to law school, and, uh, and at that time I said to myself, I really want to go to law school, and, and if I wanted to be part or around the securities industry, I would more likely do it as a principal than as a lawyer. So the best laid, of, uh, the, the, the best laid plans went awry. Sure. So you came back to D.C. and you joined Wilmer Cutler and Pickering. Right. And you spent a number of years there before you joined the SEC. Can you talk a little about your career at Wilmer Cutler? Yeah, and that, that really is how I uh, came to be a securities enforcement lawyer. Uh, I ended up uh, doing a lot of work, uh, not particularly by choice at the, at the outset, but, but soon came to really love it uh, with uh, uh, in particular, Ted Levine, who had been an associate director in the SEC's enforcement division uh, before he joined Wilmer as a partner. And uh, Wilmer had a significant practice uh, built around, in those days, uh, uh, Ted Levine and Art Matthews. Okay. Can you tell me a little bit, you so mentioned Ted Levine and Art Matthews as well. What did you learn from them? Oh. Um, uh, hard to know where to begin because I sort of learned everything from them. Uh, you know, I spent probably two years uh, working almost exclusively with Ted. Um, and, uh, you know, it was a very different kind of practice, I think, than uh, you saw in, you know, standalone uh, uh, litigation departments of law firms. Um, uh, just the way that they taught you how to deal with the government, uh, the, the way they thought about uh, the SEC as an agency and indeed even as an enforcement agency was, I think, um, a, a product of the way they had been trained at the SEC. And, and you know, we'll, we'll probably get into this it, it, a little bit about, uh, for me, it was a little bit about how the SEC was unique as a Washington agency, you know, I think in their minds and certainly uh, soon in my mind, you know, it was the gem of Washington agencies. Um, but it was also sort of different in the way it went about its prosecutorial or enforcement business. Um, and so that was, uh, I think, a, a very large part of what they communicated to me by osmosis and otherwise when I was working, when I was working with them. So that might answer a little bit of my next question, which has to do with your decision to leave the firm and go to the SEC. So you'd been over a decade at the firm. You were a partner by that time, I assume. Right. Uh, how did you wind up suddenly moving from that to be deputy director, or maybe not suddenly? Um, yeah, it was it was it was pretty quick. Um, I think uh, what happened was uh, Dick Walker, who was my predecessor as the head of the enforcement division, was looking for a deputy. Um, I think he had decided to look outside. Uh, one of his close colleagues at the division said, 
if you're looking on the outside, I've been across the table from this kid, because I was a kid, Cutler, you may want to think about him. I think Dick picked up the phone, uh, talked to Bill McLucas, who had joined Wilmer probably a year earlier from the enforcement staff, uh, and, uh, and maybe six months earlier, I can't remember, but uh, um, Bill called me and said, hey, would, would this be of interest? And I said, you bet it would. I mean, you know, I came to Washington in part because it was a place where, you know, you, you might be in the private sector, but uh, duty would call and you'd go work in, in, in the government on behalf of the people of the United States. I mean, that's how I thought about it. So this was, in my view, this incredible opportunity um, I think I immediately picked up the phone and called Dick, whom I didn't know. I think I'd been introduced to once, and I said, when can I start? Um, and, and, and it took off from there. So it's an interesting transition because you came in as the number two person in the division with, it sounds like, on one sense, a good knowledge of SEC enforcement, but of course you hadn't been uh, on the staff before. Right. Did that create any unusual challenges for you? How was it? Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, because I, you know, look, uh, uh, the, the agency, uh, particularly, I think, back, uh, so this was in 1999 when I started, so it would, this would have been 98. Uh, I, I think, you know, the agency had a long, proud history of promoting from within, and rightly so. I mean, the talent at the place was, uh, was astoundingly good. Uh, so, yeah, it, it, it was a challenge. I think, you know, there, there were people who thought, gee, why, why are we going to the outside? Um, what, what does he know? He hasn't, he hasn't done it from this side of the table. And, by the way, you know, is he captured? Uh, you know, is he, is he part of that defense bar? And, you know, can he make the transition to become uh, an enforcer? So, I, you know, I think I, I had to deal with that skepticism and, uh, and, and on the part of some people, I think disappointment that they weren't in that job. So sure, I think that would be the case whenever anyone came in from outside of an organization and, and, and uh, you know, was, was appointed to a senior level position. Sure. So the end of the 1990s was an interesting time for the SEC, but there were also challenges going on, many stemming from what seems to be the perennial under-resourcing or the unwillingness of Congress to provide perhaps the resources the SEC would like. Right. Also, there was high turnover in part because government salaries were much lower than what was in the private sector. Did you, how did you find the, the staff when you actually joined the enforcement division? I mean, I would, first and foremost, and maybe this is first and last, you know, just incredibly high caliber um, and, you know, really knowledgeable, savvy, uh, and, um, you know, good at what they did, good at what we did. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I quickly learned, I, 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 I actually still have this incident seared in my head because it was a real lesson to me. I think, you know, I got to the place, I had my own ideas about, you know, the insider trading program and one plus one, you know, disgorgement plus a one-time penalty and, 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 so I remember I, I put out a memo and I drafted a memo on how we were going to address in, in, you know, certain kinds of insider trading cases and I sent it to all. And within about three minutes, you know, I got back, you know, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? You know, what about this other thing? And I remember saying to myself, never again. I mean, I've got all this, incre this incredible reservoir of knowledge and talent and um, I better talk to people before I try to do anything that's important. And by the way, that was a lesson that I learned as a young lawyer from Ted Levine and Art Matthews, you know, who all, always used to consult with each other on important issues. And I'd forgotten it when I got to the <laughs> SEC for that moment, but uh, uh, sort of promised myself I would never make that mistake again. So what did you, I understand you entered as obviously deputy director. Did you have certain issues you thought you either wanted to address, you thought you should bring to the fore, that perhaps hadn't been considered before? Yeah, I, I don't think I thought of it that way. Um, there, there were certainly issues that uh, the then director, Dick Walker, wanted me to focus on. Um, I, I did not have, 
um, you know, a line of people that reported to me only, and then I would report to Dick. Maybe there were a couple, uh, but you know, generally, uh, the way I thought about it organizationally was that Dick and I were in a box, uh, and that you know, senior people reported to the two of us. Um, so it was my role was more of as deputy, more of an assistant role to Dick than it was. Gee, I've got. Uh, you know, these, these eight people report to me and these other eight people report to Dick. But there were a couple of issues that he said, hey, I really would like you to focus on. So this was the, you know, sort of the early days of the use of the internet to uh, tout and market stocks. So that was an issue that was very much on the forefront of our minds at the SEC back in 99, 2000, uh, you know, part of the internet bubble. Um, uh, you know, Dick had put into place uh, a real focus and, you know, you might say one of the original task forces on financial fraud. And so, uh, you know, he, he wanted me really to sort of focus on how are we going to get these cases, you know, from start to finish. They're really complicated cases. Uh, they require, you know, a lot of uh, care, uh, uh, but it's taking us too long. You know, how, how can we develop a method to, to bring these cases instead of, you know, four years after the fact uh, to do what he called then real time or more real time enforcement? Actually, that may have been a phrase coined later, but that, that, was, that was how how Dick thought about it and how Arthur Levitt at the time thought about it. And uh, so I, I'd say it was financial reporting was a focus and Internet was a, was a real focus uh, when I was the deputy. So I ask a little more about several of those things. I wanted to ask a quick organizational question, which is you said you didn't, so the, the traditional organization would be the attorneys, branch chiefs, assistant director, associate directors. Did they then point, uh, pardon me, did they then report directly to Dick? Did you see, it sounds like you didn't see yourself as, as them reporting to you and then you reporting to Dick. Right, I don't, yeah, we didn't set it up so that, uh, you know, it was it, it was uh, a violation of protocol if people went directly to Dick, they had to go to Steve. That that wasn't how we set it up. So um, I think the way I thought about it at the time was that, you know, my job was to make people want to come to me, um, not that they had to come to me. Um, and, you know, in that way, I was going to make their lives easier as well as my boss's life easier. Okay. Um you mentioned real-time enforcement, and that's a phrase that seems to sh has shown up at, from, from other interviews and other sources. What did you understand that to mean? Yeah, I, 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 I think it was pretty simple. Uh, you know, we want to try to bring cases close in time to when the underlying conduct happens. Mm -hmm. That the further, the, the more you separate those two, the harder it is to, I think, communicate what you want to communicate about the case, the harder it is to make it relevant, the harder it is to make it something that has a deterrent effect, which is obviously a very important part of a, an effective uh, enforcement program. Uh, you know, if the event happens in year one and you don't bring an enforcement action until year six, seven, or eight, it, it's hard to get people's attention and it's hard to make them think this is really important. Okay. Why'd you wait this long? What kind of steps? did you take to try oh, to speed things along? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think, you know, part of it was, this is, this is before the days where I think we had what I would consider great visibility and great tools, you know, data tools to do that. Uh, you know, it, it was almost, you know, a very manual process of what are our 50 most important cases and we'll, we're going to keep a list of those and we're just going to keep on going to the people who are working on those and saying, hey, what are you doing on this now? What's happened since the last time I talked to you? But it was, I would not say it was a methodical uh, automated process that I think it is much more of today at the SEC where lots of reports are generated and the like. I think we were just beginning that uh, uh, probably through the time that I was director. You okay. know, a much more, a much, a much more robust um, uh, electronic reporting process, for example. And you mentioned Financial Fraud Task Force, and I find that interesting because you're talking about 1999, that period <coughs> when I would think of the great financial frauds of the period you were at the SEC is starting at the end of 2001, in other words, a couple of years afterwards. Do you right. know why 
Yeah, I think uh, you know it it, uh, it 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 dated back to uh, Arthur Levitt, um, who who really I think saw something that maybe others didn't see, which is which was ultimately captured in his uh, famous numbers game speech, um, and you know he he thought that there was a lot of shenanigans go, uh, shenanigans going on in financial reporting. And um, and I think you know I, I think under his leadership and Dick was the director at the time, you know there was a real focus on gee we 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 better bring these cases we better focus on this uh, as an area for us you know to devote resources to and and I think the idea behind this financial reporting or financial fraud task force is. We want to show that we're serious about it, and we want to develop the expertise so that we can bring these cases, you know, in in a, a way that's faster than we might have done them in the past. Okay, and you also mentioned the internet cases, and it seems you joined at such an interesting time, which is just at the peak of the internet bubble, but as you suggested, also a time when uh, criminals and and fraudsters were realizing how useful the internet would be for their work. Right. So uh, yeah, so we we I think during my time as deputy brought you know some of the early internet touting cases or the first internet touting cases. I remember we had this uh, case against this infamous uh, internet touter named Tokyo Joe or code name Tokyo Joe, uh, and 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 you know we were also thinking about you know what are statutory tools that we can use to go after this that we might not have used before. And so, uh, you know, we, we actually looked really carefully at, you know, what are potential legal hooks that we could use to, to address this? And, um, you know, was he getting paid and disclosing what, what he had been paid and, uh, and you know, finding hooks to, uh, to, to make sure that, you know, we were uh, addressing and appropriately cabining wrongful conduct in this area that was uh, you know, doing a disservice to investors. Okay, so after about two years as deputy director, uh, Dick Walker left the SEC and I believe you were named acting director before you were named permanent director. That's right. So how did the transition, how did it work from you becoming deputy director to you becoming director? Yeah, uh, so uh, I I think I have this right. Um, I think uh, Laura Unger was named the acting chair when Arthur Levitt left. I think Laura appointed me to be an interim or acting okay. director. That was prior to Harvey Pitt being uh, uh, named as chairman. Harvey starts, I want to say, in the summer of 2001. Uh, and I was, uh, I would consider it a very public audition that I was doing. Uh, I certainly knew Harvey, you know, no one in the securities enforcement area uh, wouldn't have known Harvey, uh, but we didn't know each other well, and I think, you know, Harvey wanted to see, is this going to work? Uh, and uh, fortunately for me, I think he decided uh, probably three months down the road that you know, yes, this this will work, and he named me the permanent director. Okay, how did um, how did your relationship with Harvey Pitt? How, how, what was your relationship with Pitt like? And one reason I ask that is because in I believe October of two thousand one, after he had become chairman, he gave a speech suggesting it would be a kinder, gentler SEC going forward. And I didn't know what it felt like as being director of enforcement when when you heard that. Yeah, um, you know, obviously that that ended up getting a lot of attention, probably even more so in light of events that transpired. So I think it, in some ways it was really unfortunate timing that you know you had uh, uh, you know the top cop for Wall Street talk about kinder, gentler, and then you know probably within months, uh, if not weeks, uh, you, you had uh, Enron collapse. Um, so I, 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 I don't think I took it as a uh, call to disarm the SEC. I, I think, you know, around the edges, Harvey was thinking, hey, there's stuff that he had seen. And, you know, let's not forget, Har Harvey was a longtime veteran uh, 
of the SEC, but that there are things that he had seen as a defense lawyer that, that he didn't think were quite right, and he wanted to do a little bit of recalibration. But again, I, didn't, I never thought of it as a wholesale uh, laying down of, of, uh, of, of the enforcement arsenal, not in any way, shape, or form. Okay, so, so did you, then you felt that, or did you feel that your sort of goals for enforcement were in line with his? Um, I don't know that I ever thought about whether my goals were different than his. I mean, I, my, my goal was to have uh, a strong and really professional enforcement program. Um, and I don't think those were, um, I, I, I never thought of those as somehow different than Harvey's own goals. Um, but, you know, Harvey was thinking about things uh, that, you know, I think to this day uh, people would say were probably worth thinking about, like um, what became known as the CBOR 21A report. You know, how are we going to communicate to uh, uh, the issuer community, the regulated community, uh, to defense lawyers that there is value in being cooperative. What do we mean when we say we want you to cooperate? Um, and so, I, you know, I thought that was a very useful exercise. Uh, again, you know, I had spent a good part of my professional career to that point also on the defense side. And, and, and look, I, I understood that uh, being able to give some clarity around what it is the agency meant when it said, you know, we're going to reward co cooperation. Uh, I, I always thought was a useful thing. Okay. Did you find Seaboard had a useful effect? Uh, that's, that's an interesting question because I think, you know, almost immediately upon the issuance of Seaboard, we had Enron collapse. I think the world changed a little bit. And so I think one of the challenges we had as a division was, you know, as, as we were changing or recalibrating, how the SEC was going to think about sanctions and penalties and, uh, and, and its use of its arsenal. At the same time, you had Seaboard saying, we're, we're, we, we're, we want to clarify our, our approach to cooperation. So one of the reactions we had, I think, from the defense bar was, what do you mean I'm getting credit for cooperating? You're imposing the greatest fine that, that you know, anyone's ever heard of. And so it, it, one of the challenges we had was convincing people, well, it would be worse if you weren't cooperative um, because it was hard for them to see that if all they were looking at was past precedent. Because we were setting new bars, I think, uh, in the aftermath of, of, of Enron and, and thereafter. And I suppose that's a nice transition to, to what must have been a very dramatic period during your time at the SEC, which was the exposure of Enron at the end of 2001, WorldCom very early in 2002, and then a series of other scandals, Global Crossing, Quest, and others that immediately followed it. Right. So how did that, I suppose I want to ask you a little bit about some of those particular things, but as a start, <coughs> how did the series of those series of exposures coming so close together change your work or change your perception of what was going on for, for the job of the Enforcement Division? Yeah. Um, I, I think certainly it, it did result in a, uh, in a different mindset around uh, penalties and, and sanctions generally. And, you know, if you, uh, I guess you have to remember the, the commission's penalty power outside the regulated entity world, you know, was relatively new. Um, and. Uh, and if you really look back at the agency's history and, you know, and, and if you talk to the people who trained me as a securities lawyer like Ted Levine and Art Matthews, you know, I don't think they thought of the agency as first and foremost an enforcement agency in the sense that we probably do to today, which is we're going to penalize. I think they thought of enforcement as we are going to induce good conduct going forward. Um, and I think, you know, it, it, I think one of the things that Enron did is it really accentuated this look backwards, if you will. Um, and part of that look backwards was 
you know, we are going to start getting a lot tougher when it comes to penalizing misconduct. This isn't just, uh, you know, enjoining you going forward or having you put in place, you know, a whole new set of policies and procedures. We are going to try to make this painful because we think that's an important part of the commission's role in deterring misconduct. Okay. So I'm actually going to ask, I want to return to these cases in a second, but the first case in which uh, a, penalty, a penalty really appeared to be very large and get a lot of publicity was actually Xerox uh, in, I believe, 2001. And looking back, of course, the penalty imposed was $10 million which seems quite small compared to what came over the next couple of years. Right. Um, what was people's, however, however, Xerox at the time provoked really quite a, quite a strong pushback from people. Yeah, cer certainly in the bar, I think it did. Okay. I remember going to uh, a small bar function and you know getting pilloried by mm -hmm. the defense lawyers about Xerox. I would have, I would have thought it was earlier than 2001 because I, I, I have in mind that Dick was the director and, um, and, and I remember one of the, it, look, it, it wasn't a crazy thing that the defense bar was saying, uh, you know, which was, look, the focus of this agency has never been on, on penalties per se, and particularly in cases where the victims are arguably the shareholders themselves. So where are you getting that penalty from? You're getting it from the, the, the company's coffers. And, you know, ultimately that's being paid by the shareholders. And so, you know, does it make sense? So that was one. And two was, you know, is there any penalty that you could impose that is really going to have that deterrent effect? So, you know, if you think about $10 million, I think it falls into that category. Is, is $10 million really going to deter? Or does it deter because of the reputational impact that imposing a penalty of $10 million when in the past you hadn't uh, is going to have? It, you know, is it going to have that reputational impact? Well, if that's the reason, then, you know, aren't you saying that $10 million is not going to be enough for the next one? The next one's going to have to be 20, and then it's going to have to be 50, and then it's going to have to be 100. And, and, you know, and I think you know, some in the defense bar around the 2000, 2001, 2002 era would say that's what happened, that you got into the spiral because uh, you, know, you, you uh, had to convince the world that this was important. And one of the ways to do that was to say it was higher than the last one. So where did the push for, because it really was quite dramatic, and within a few years the, the number of penalties just increased enormously. Yeah. Where did the push for that come from? Yeah, Internally, I, externally? I, um, I would say <laughs> both. Okay. Um, uh, I, I recall being in a meeting with, uh, uh, the, with the director at the time when I was the deputy, Dick, and our chief accountant, Walter Schutz, he was the chief accountant of the enforcement division. And Walter, in his stentorian voice, um, said to the room of assembled people, and this was all internal enforcement folks, I think the penalty in this case should be a hundred million dollars. And we all were just taken aback. I mean, you know, at the time, I think Xerox was the highest penalty in a financial reporting case at 10, and Walter was saying 100. And I think Walter beat us to the punch a little bit. He, he, he was saying, for this to matter to companies, it has to sting, uh, and it has to be significant. And in the world of Xerox, I think what Walter was saying, he didn't say it exactly this way, uh, 10 million is just not going to feel that significant. Um, so, so certainly there were people inside the building, and then you know, as I think the commission uh, changed over time, and you had new leadership, and then and then I I do think Enron and WorldCom really changed the calculus. Um, I, I think you know there was a lot more of a clarion call inside the agency, but at the same time. Uh, you know, you, you, you certainly had people outside the agency saying, 
w you know, what is the, is the SEC a tough enough regulator? Um, you know, if it has the tools to impose significant fines, why isn't it using those tools? And I think, you know, that was a challenge for us is, um, uh, I don't think we, we wanted to become uh, another DOJ, um, that we, we did think of ourselves as a different kind of enforcement agency than, uh, you know, standalone enforcement agencies. We had other tools. We were concerned about the integrity of the markets. Um, and, you know, if, if we could make the markets better going forward, that was, that was still going to have to be the focus. Um, uh, so it was a challenge for us to find that right ground, you know, between not, not looking backwards and penalizing in that sense at all to, you know, being only focused on that and, and we didn't want to do that either. Okay. And as you mentioned, there was some outside criticism of the SEC in 2001, 2002 after the series of uh, crises. Did that, I suppose, did you, you must have been aware of it. Sure. Did that necessarily change the approach you took? How did it affect people? Um, yeah, I mean, I, it, look, we should probably get more specific about what okay. the criticisms were and, and, and where they were arising from. But uh, look, I, I like to say, you know, n no one uh, does a job in a vacuum. And, you know, was the SEC mindful of uh, outside criticism? Um, yes. And, um, you know, I think particularly in the wake of the Enron collapse and WorldCom, the SEC went from being a business section agency to being a front section of the newspaper agency. Um, that was a very different thing, at least in my lifetime, as a securities enforcement lawyer. Um, and and it, it, the, the place, I, I think, in some ways became very interesting to politicians, uh, to Congress in a way that it hadn't been uh, at least as interesting before. Um, and I think that played a part in and how the agency went about its business from, call it, 2001 on. I mean, in the, in the midterm elections in uh, 2002, I'll never forget, you know, TV ads that had <coughs> photographs of President Bush, Vice President Cheney, and Chairman Harvey Pitt. I mean, that was astounding. You know, the SEC's part of a campaign ad? Uh, and so does that have, you know, invariably, I think, inevitably, I think, that, that has an impact. Okay. And I know it's been suggested uh, that, in fact, at a, at a roundtable a while back, that this might actually have been a result of much greater media coverage of business in general. For instance, 1999-2000, constant coverage of the rising stock market and rising uh, NASDAQ in a way that simply hadn't occurred, say, 10 years before that the internet bubble, the internet business as a whole suddenly became front page news and the rapid growth of these businesses. Yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, you saw the rise of CNBC um, uh, and, uh, and, and I think, you know, in some ways, uh, you know, covering markets became, um, you know, for at least a large part of, uh, of, of America, a little bit like the sports section. Um, you know, it, it, was, it, it, it was interesting in a way that maybe it hadn't been before. Okay. So getting back to the enforcement division and the, and the activities of 2001, 2002 and financial fraud, um, what was the role, what role does the director play when you have multiple investigations? I think by late 2002, someone had commented there was a restatement every, literally, a company was restating its financials every day. What did that actually mean for your work, since you obviously weren't running a particular investigation? Right. Um, you know, I think a lot of it was making sure that we had the right resources devoted to the cases that um, we were pushing aggressively to get them investigated and done. Um, that, you know, we were uh, trying to be innovative in the way we went about investigating cases, maybe you know, instead of, of uh, tying up every loose end so that we could get the nth defendant, you know, 
thinking, gee, let's let's focus on the company and and the top three defendants and uh, and think about it that way. I should say prospective defendants or possible defendants. Um, so uh, you know, it, 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 you're right. You're thinking about the the division programmatically. Um, do I have the right people working on cases? Um, you know, when when Enron broke, uh, I I went to the deputy, my deputy director, Linda Thompson, and said, I want you on this, like every day. Um, and so, you know, you, you, would, you, you might use different approaches on different cases. Uh, certainly I wasn't involved in the actual investigations, but I was getting, you know, briefed and rebriefed very frequently on these big, high profile, important matters to make sure that we weren't letting balls drop. Uh, and, you know, always with the question in mind, you know, where are we going? When are we gonna be finished? Uh, you know, what do we think this involves? Um, look, I will, I will forever give Harvey Pitt credit. When WorldCom broke, Harvey said to me, we're bringing this case tomorrow. I mean, the day after WorldCom announced they had misstated their, their uh, uh, financials. And my reaction at the time was, we can't do that. And I think that was my out loud reaction. And Harvey said, yes, we can. You can do it. And I went back to the staff that, uh, that I'd assigned to the case and said, can we bring this case tomorrow? And I think I got the same response. You know, are you crazy? That's not the way we, 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 don't, we can't do that. Um, but we could. We could. So, you know, I think bringing that sort of, you know, we can do this. It doesn't have to be exactly the way we did it in the past. Um, you know, sensibility to it was part of my job. And indeed, <coughs> excuse me, I think going back to Dick bringing me into the agency, I mean, I think he would have said, I think that's what he would have wanted is, look, I want people who can think about this differently because they haven't spent the last 20 years here. And I think you know, everybody knows, it's, it's harder to think about doing things differently if you're the one that's been doing them that way for a long, long time. So that actually raises an interesting question, which is how, what was your approach to managing a fairly lar the fairly large and sophisticated and very talented staff, uh, enforcement staff? Yeah. Well, part of it is, do you have the right people in the right places and letting them do their thing? Um, and you know, a lot of really good management is is finding the right people, and uh, and so certainly that's part of it. And part of it is, uh, you know, going back and sort of wanting accountability. You know, y you told me last time we'd be done with X, Y, and Z by now. We're not. Why not? You know, and asking those questions that are, un, you know, that are going to be uncomfortable, but but that's what a manager does. Um, so, uh, but but yes, it's a challenge. You've got, I think, at the time you had a thousand people or nine hundred people mm -hmm. spread out over, um, you know, probably a dozen offices and and a tradition within you know the regional office structure of a lot of independence, um, and so. Uh, again, you know, I would say part of, I, I, I mentioned that, you know, part of what I considered my job to be as deputy was, you know, I, I, I want people to think of going to Cutler as adding value. You know, that's the thing I want to do. And, you know, I, I don't think, I, I hope I didn't lose that mindset when I became the director. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'm, my, my hope would have been uh, and other people will be able to reflect on this, that they continue to find value in, in that, not just because I was their boss, but because, you know, I could help, you know, hey, let's think about this differently. Let's find a way to get this done. Let's find a way to bring this case. Let's think about using uh, this statute or this regulation, or, you know, we haven't brought a case like this in, you know, X years, it's time we brought one. Let's, let's do this, let's, let's go with this approach. Okay. As a quick follow-up, you mentioned the regional offices. What was your relationship to them? It was very good. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. 
Um, yeah, it. it uh, uh, I would say it was very good. Okay. Uh, I, uh, yeah. Look, it's, you know, s some of them at the time. Uh, I think uh, it, it was it was better with some than with others. Uh, the, the agency had gone from uh, a. Uh, this was before I got there, but where you know regional heads were reporting directly to the chairman, to regional heads then reporting to Bill McLucas, uh, was then the director uh, for certainly for enforcement uh, matters. And so, you know, I think uh, you know we we were still probably experiencing when I got to the agency as as deputy some growing pains around the switch. Um, because I think, you know, a lot of the regional directors liked the notion that they were answerable only to the chairman. Um, but I think, look, one of the things that we wanted to do and one of the things that I was uh, certainly, um, I think, focused on when I was the director was we want a national program. We don't want it to be the case that if you bring uh, a matter in Los Angeles, it's going to look really different uh, from a matter that's brought in the home office or brought in New York. You know, we wanted there to be consistency, consistency of priorities, consistency of approach, knowing that, you know, geographical differences were going to create differences in priorities, you know, that there were going to be more of a of broker-dealer cases in New York than there would be in uh, in Denver. Okay. Yeah. Um, so one of the one of the things that you seem to focus on as director was a resurgence of uh, attention to gatekeepers, which has always obviously been a concern going all the way back to Judge Sporkin. Right. But in 2003, I believe you actually gave a speech speaking of a new enforcement model. Maybe even earlier in 2003. I'm sorry. Speaking of a new enforcement model and focusing especially on uh, holding accounting partners as well as, a, I'm sorry, accounting firms as well as individual partners of accounting firms uh, to task for violations. Right, uh, so, uh, you know, this is in the throes of some of the big financial reporting cases that, uh, that you mentioned. And, um, you know, a, as I began to think about this, um, you know, in, in every other walk of SEC life, we seem to think about both individuals and entities. And, you know, we, we didn't have any blanket policy that said, we're only going to sue the individuals, we're not going to sue the entities. So, you know, if there was a problem at a, an investment advisor, you know, we think about the people who caused that problem, and we think about the advisor itself. And in the broker-dealer world, the same thing. You know, the, the people who caused the problem and then the broker-dealer entity. And I guess sort of the thought I had is why, why are we treating audit firms differently? And not making the mistake I had made when I started as deputy when I sent out that insider trading memo, I talked to a lot of people around the division, around the agency. And I never felt like I had a satisfactory answer other than this is the way we do it. And to the extent that you think that entity cases are an important way to achieve deterrence, I thought, gee, entity cases involving audit firms maybe could be that too. And in an era where we thought, gee, that this, the, you know, financial reporting and the auditing of financial reporting really needs more attention, that was, that was the thinking. Um, so I talked to the chairman of the SEC, and, and then I ended up delivering that speech to the, uh, I believe it was to the AICPA. <laughs> and um, how, did the, how did the AICPA handle, respond to your speech? I don't remember getting rousing cheers from the audience when I delivered that one. <laughs> let's, okay. let's, let's put it that way. And if I can actually ask one question, sort of follow up to that, which is obviously uh, Arthur Anderson got into huge trouble over Enron, yeah. collapsed within a year or so of Enron, did the collapse of one of the big five accounting firms change your approach at all? Make it seem more desirable, less desirable? I don't think so. Um, I mean, we shouldn't forget that that, that collapse was uh, arguably the result of 
a criminal prosecution, yes. not a civil enforcement case. And so I, I didn't think, and the experience that we had, you know, going forward when we didn't bring cases against audit firms themselves wasn't, you know, this is going to imperil the life of the audit firm. Um, and, and look, you know, you, you, could, you can say this in lots of different ways. The more of it that you did, the less uh, uh, you'd worry about it being one of these, you know, imperiling acts. Okay. So in 2002, obviously in the wake of Enron, WorldCom, Global Crossing, Sarbanes-Oxley was passed and created new requirements ranging from CEO, CFO certification, establishment of PCAOB, uh, I believe a budget budget increase for the SEC. Did you did that? Ch did you perceive the effects of Sarbanes Oxley? Did that change? Did you see the environment in which you were operating change? What effect did that have on enforcement work? Um, I, I I don't. I, I'm going to say it didn't have direct a direct impact on enforcement work that I was doing at that time because it was going to take time for. Sarbanes Oxley, uh, Oxley to affect meaningful change, you know, and, and in an enforcement division, you wouldn't see that for years down the road. But do I think it ended up, you know, creating sort of a meaningfully different environment for financial reporting? Yes, I do. Okay. As a quick follow up, uh, fair funds was obviously a significant element of Sarbanes Oxley. And since we were already talking about the very high penalties that wound up being paid, how do you, do you think fair funds made it? Did it make it easier to impose penalties? Did it, did it encourage people to support higher penalties? Yeah, I think um, uh, I, I, I think if you could return penalty money to harmed investors, um, I, I, I do think it gave you another, I, I, I think, I think it made the imposition of penalties uh, something that would have better effect than the money just dropping into the Treasury of the United States. Um, look, I think that there's an interesting question about what role the SEC should have. Uh, and, um, you know, I think prior to fair funds and, um, you know, you, you, you could return disgorgement amounts to investors, but the, the, the focus wasn't on the agency as, um, you know, effectively a plaintiff in a civil lawsuit where you were thinking about damages, right? And, and of course, disgorgement and damages are not synonymous. Um, I, I, I think there's a legitimate question to be asked about whether, you know, penalty money going to harmed investors and you know when you're creating sort of billion dollar funds or you know just huge funds for monies to be returned to investors you've changed again further changed i think uh what the mission of the enforcement program of the sec is but i think we were already beginning to walk down that path uh and again walk down that path in the sense of you know this isn't just about uh, you know, changing the policies, changing the procedures, changing the structure, improving things going forward. It is about uh, uh, sanctions. And I think once you got to that place, right, you were thinking more about, well, what should we do with this sanction? What should we do with this money? And wouldn't it be a good thing rather than dropping the money into the treasury to get it back to the victims? Okay. On balance, I think it was a, a very positive development. So shifting gears a little, you, your time was very eventful. So there were quite yes. a few uh, major topics to cover. And uh, I want to move on to, to a couple of uh, things that came up in 2002 and 2003, which were, uh, first of all, the conflict of interest, analyst conflict of interest on Wall Street, and then mutual fund, both late trading and market timing. But perhaps we should start our discussion of that with your interactions with New York, then New York Attorney General Elliot Spitzer since, I'll put it this way, the media report suggested there was a bit of a contentious relationship between him and the SEC. So could you talk a little about your relationship there? Yeah, I think uh, we actually had a, a reasonably good relationship. Um, uh, I, I, uh, 
I always thought that if, if uh, then Attorney General Spitzer told me he was going to do X, I could trust that he was going to do X. Um, uh, you know, obviously there was tension, I think, between us and between the SEC and the New York Attorney General because, uh, you know, he was bringing cases uh, involving the markets. Sure. And, um, and not only was he bringing cases, just to, to use some of the vernacular that I used before, that were backward looking, he was thinking about, well, shouldn't I change the way this is done? Or the very fact that he was bringing a significant case was going to change the way that, that uh, something was going to be done because, uh, you know, sitting in New York, he, he, had, he had jurisdiction over, the, over all the big brokerage firms. Um, and so, you know, one of the things I think the agency had to contend with was, look, the, the SEC needs to be setting policy, if you will, uh, when it comes to how the markets are governed. But now you have someone who's bringing, you know, some pretty cutting edge cases uh, that is effectively having that impact as well. And so I think that created tension. How did you wind up, uh, well, that's actually maybe a good, maybe it's a good place to move on to the research analyst cases, which were the first of the major cases he brought. And if you can talk a little about your interaction with the New York Attorney General's office during that period, because as you said, you, you've got two agencies, both very proud of themselves, both very cognizant of their responsibilities, really trying to share uh, a space that it might be easier if one agency or the other was occupying by itself. Right. Um, uh, well, I, I think sort of the genesis of, of our relationship was uh, came in the aftermath of uh, of, of uh, uh, Mr. Spitzer bringing a case against Merrill Lynch, and I think he called. I remember him calling me up, uh, and we had a bunch of mutual friends. I don't know that we had met previously, and mm -hmm. uh, he had just brought the case and and went into court seeking a temporary restraining order against Merrill Lynch uh, and he got it from the state uh, the New York uh, state judge and um, and he called me up and he introduced himself and uh, said I'm being told by Merrill Lynch's lawyers that I've just put them out of the mutual fund business and I knew a little bit about the securities laws and I said well in fact if you've gotten a TRO that's exactly the effect of what you've done um, so you know for look for he wasn't a securities guy mm -hmm. uh, he was a New York he was the New York Attorney General he was a state enforcer uh, so you know we we had we had different orientations uh, but look I think you know to his credit I think Elliot recognized you know, pretty early on in that research case that, you know, he couldn't do that himself. He couldn't do that case, nor should he do it himself, that it was important to get the SEC involved um, because it, it was going to have an impact on how uh, the, the securities markets worked, how research was done on Wall Street. Uh, and, you know, we had, frankly, more resources to deploy. Um, I do think in the course of that, I think he recognized that politically he had done something really, really interesting, which is, you know, he, he was able to say, uh, I did this, the SEC didn't. And in some ways, politically, that was more effective than being able to say, you know, I did this, I went after this bad guy. Um, and so, again, that probably heightened the tension. Uh, because, uh, you know, it, it, it enhanced the criticism, I think, that the agency was getting because it didn't, it didn't see the research analyst problem. And when I've thought about that in retrospect, I think part of that is because the SEC was in a way too close to w the evolution of research on Wall Street, that it saw it that it saw what research looked like in, in 1975 when brokerage commissions were deregulated. And it was there every step of the way, you know, from 1975 to 2000. And I always say when you're in the middle of something, you know, when you're in the weeds of something, it's much harder to actually look at it anew.
So if you, if you were able to look at the practices in research on Wall Street in 1975, and then look at them in the year 2000, you would have seen inc an incredible change in how that worked. You know, you would have seen research analysts that had, had been sort of part of, you know, in, a, in, in some ways a backwater on Wall Street to research analysts being rock stars, being on CNBC, making, you know, investment banker type salaries, being evaluated by investment banking. I think these were all things that happened so incrementally that it was hard for an agency that was actually, you know, seeing those things happen incrementally to see the bigger picture. And so in some, in some ways, the fact that, that uh, the New York Atten Attorney General's office uh, you know, wasn't part of, you know, oversight of, you know, regulated entities may have helped them to see that in a way that the agency didn't. Okay. Quick question. What did, so you said it, it was beneficial politically to point to the SEC, politically for the cases he was bringing, no. politically for him personally? I think for the Attorney General personally. Okay. Yeah. Um, so roughly a year later, you reached the global settlement which actually had both a backward-looking and a forward-looking element. Right. Backward-looking $1.4 billion paid in various ways. By, by maybe 10 firms. Yes, yeah. by, but not an individual firm, by 10 firms. But also a restructuring of how analyst work was done. Yeah. And I'm curious, how did you, and, I, and this was obviously the Attorney General's office, the SEC, I might have been a couple of other agencies as well, but you are clearly the big yeah, actually, we, we ended up working with the NASD, with the New York Stock Exchange, with the uh, uh, state securities regulators uh, through NASA. Um, so there were quite a, a, a large, there was quite a large number of regulators at the table. Um, I, I would say that the SEC took the lead on the forward-looking, um, you know, prophylactic piece. Mm -hmm. You know, how are we going to prevent this from happening again? How are we going to think about where research analysts sit within Wall Street firms? You know, that's where I think we had the expertise. And uh, I think, you know, uh, the enforcement staff used to make fun of me. They'd walk into my office and I had on my, my uh, computer screen for weeks on end the, uh, the appendix that, that served as this uh, a template for how this is going to be done uh, going forward that all the firms uh, agree to and and uh, you know part of the reason why you know I was was personally involved in that is that was my area of expertise before I came to the agency when I worked uh, in private practice I did enforcement stuff but I did uh, broker dealer regulatory stuff too so I, I I understood the stuff and and the agency more broadly obviously with market reg and with OC had had the real expertise I think that was going to be a question how did you who in who within the SEC sort of came together to design that forward-looking yeah so I, I would have said it, it was uh, within the agency it was uh, OC it was Lori Richards who was then yeah. running OC and it was Bob Colby and Annette Nazareth uh, in uh, in market regulation okay yeah and I don't know if this is the best place to ask but I'm I'm curious thinking about uh, the interaction of enforcement and regulation the phrase is used to describe uh, the phrase uh, regulation by enforcement is occasionally used to describe some things the SEC does sometimes descriptively other people have used it more critically and I'm curious about your view of how enforcement played into regulation. You've, we've, you've suggested a bit already. Yeah. But, but if you could expand on that a yeah, little bit. Yeah, again, I mean, I, I, uh, look, I think regulation by enforcement means different things to different people. Um, if what you're doing is calling something unlawful that you don't have a statutory basis or a regulatory basis or rule basis, I should say, for calling unlawful, and that's what people mean by regulation by enforcement. I I think that is problematic. Um, and you know, no one should forget that a lot of the agency's enforcement docket is resolved through settlement. And so, um, you know, there 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 there's a lot of agency made uh, uh, law, if you will through the cases the agency decides to 
to bring and settle. And so you have to be very careful that you do have a proper statutory or rule basis for any enforcement action. And, and look, I, I, rec I hope I recognize sufficiently at the time, and you know, certainly I've, I've, I've been sensitive to this in my life on, on the defense side, um, is you know, a lot of times you get uh, you know, particularly entities that don't feel like they're in a position to litigate. And I think you know, it's incumbent upon the agency, it's a part of, of what you have to do to do the job well, to make sure that you're not unduly taking advantage of that and bringing cases and settling cases that you don't have a, a, a good basis to bring uh, under the law. So, uh, so that's very important. When it comes to relief and, you know, is the relief creating sort of enforcement, is it creating law by enforcement? Uh, you know, maybe, the, uh, you know, the, that, that's in the eyes of the beholder. You know, I, I, I would have said, you know, one of the strengths of the agency, and I mentioned this at the outset as an enforcement agency, was that, you know, it wasn't all about the fine or, you know, the, the backwards looking stuff. It was, uh, you know, what, what are we going to do going forward? I mean, you, you do have to be careful that what you're not doing in that in, in, in is you're, you're not substituting for rulemaking for the industry as a whole and, and the like. And, and, you know, I think you have to be careful about that. When you were dealing, and I'm, I want one follow-up question, which is thinking about the different divisions within the agency. When you were bringing cases that, well, global settlement is a perhaps extreme example. Mm -hmm. When you were bringing cases that would likely have real forward-looking uh, implications for future behavior, to what extent did you coordinate with the other divisions who might have responsibility over a particular industry or particular topic? Well, you always had to coordinate. First of all, you weren't going to get a case to the commission table without uh, the relevant divisions weighing in. So. Um, you know, that was always an important part of the job and, you know, it was incumbent upon the enforcement division to make sure that it, it had uh, the right folks from the right divisions uh, participating, weighing in, consulted on cases that were going to involve, you know, those program areas. Okay. Um, coming back to, the, to your interactions with, well, interactions with the New York AG's office. Can you talk a little about the mutual fund cases that came up in 2003? Because they occupied a lot of media attention, both market timing and late trading cases. Not only mutual funds, but some hedge funds and other entities got drawn in as well. Right. So uh, I won't forget this. I think uh, so. We we had gotten through the research analyst uh, issues and brought that case and. Um, and I think uh, uh, I, I developed a pretty good working relationship with uh, the Attorney General at that point, and um, I don't know how much later it was, but, but months later uh, I'm in a staff meeting with uh, then Chairman Donaldson, and um, Bill's secretary comes into the meeting and says, uh, Steve, it's Attorney General Spitzer on the phone. And I said, well, I'm in, I'm in the staff meeting. And she said, I told him that. And he said, you'd want to be pulled out. Uh, and so I looked at Bill. And Bill said, go take it. And I took the call. I, w I went out and took the call. And, and, and uh, the attorney, attorney general said to me, I'm doing a press conference at 10 AM. Uh, it, it'll, uh, it'll get coverage on CNBC this is not going to be a good day for you guys, and you may want to watch it. So this was, this was 10, as in it was already the morning when you it took was the It was the morning of. That was the first okay. I'd heard about it. And this was what became the late trading scandal. This was the case against, uh, I think it was Canary was the name of the hedge fund, uh, and its principal, uh, Eddie Stern. Uh, and yeah. Uh, the attorney general was bringing this case involving the mutual fund industry and and so we were in a similar position where somehow we didn't see this uh, now th this was a case where I would say unlike the research analyst thing which you could argue was sort of you know in broad daylight but incremental I think this was a case that I think uh, wouldn't have come to anyone's attention didn't come to his attention uh, absent a whistleblower 
Um, and ultimately, um, I think, you know, my concern as the head of the division was, why did the whistleblower go there instead of coming to the enforcement staff? Um, I actually picked up the phone and called that whistleblower <laughs> one, once her name became public and yeah. said, you know, we want to get better. Um, you know, this is what we do. Why did you go there? And what did she say? Um, she, I think she was too polite, and I think I told her she was too polite, and I think she said, well, her sister uh, had, had uh, it, it had something to do with her sister, and her sister had seen uh, the Attorney General, and um, it, it wasn't a very satisfying explanation. At the same time, I, I also decided to, to explore what it would be like to be a whistleblower trying to navigate the SEC to get to the right person. So I remember calling up, these in the days before <laughs> caller ID, and saying, I have a complaint, you know, about, I think I've seen some misconduct, you know, can you, and, and, and it, was, it was really hard to get through to the right place, the right division, the right person, and I think it had us rethinking, you know, what was that process? Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, for us, that was the big deal. Again, with, with, with mutual fund market timing and late trading, we now had sort of a little bit of a template from the first one, which was, okay, well now, it isn't just canary we got to make sure that this isn't happening more broadly and working together with my colleague Lori Richards I think I think Lori sent out immediately like letters to a hundred different mutual fund complexes you know we want to understand your policies your practices uh, and indeed we saw this happening at a lot of different places so ultimately this didn't result in like a single big bang global settlement this was case after case after case. So once uh, perhaps Attorney General Spitzer announced the initial cases, did you, after all that occurred, did you manage to work better with him in this case? I mean, I, I, I think ultimately we worked pretty well with him on the research analyst case. Yes, I mean, I think we worked reasonably well with him on this case. There were always hiccups along the way. Um, but but I, I I recall it as at the end of the day, it was it was fine. Okay. I, I think, uh, you know, again from a uh, a public perception politics uh, perspective, he accomplished what he needed to accomplish by bringing that first case. Okay. Um, another matter that that was prominent during your time was IPO allocations, uh, and really, obviously, these would have occurred in 2000, 1999, the top of the boom, but they the enforcement matters came about under your watch. Right. Uh, the, the various spinning of hot IPO allocations, and I'm curious how those, because eventually the charges that resulted were very high profile. Yeah. And I'm curious how that came to your attention and how you pursued it. Yeah, so uh, that was, uh, uh, my recollection is that came via uh, an anonymous letter. That did come to us, that didn't okay. go to uh, the New York, New York Attorney General. and. Um, I, I think uh, it, it actually came to the head of the exam program in New York and uh, Bob Salazzo and or at least came to his attention and he collaborated with the head of the New York regional office uh, Wayne Carlin uh, and uh, and they did a cause exam of a firm and found you know at this particular firm that uh, there, there were some problems in the IPO allocation space and in particular um, I think previously people had been focused on you know were, were IPOs being allocated IPO shares being allocated to those who paid the largest commissions and uh, and, and you know from a from a legal perspective it was that that was a challenging case this was what we were seeing now was something different, which was our IPOs being allocated to the CEO or the CFO of another tech company that's still private but is going to go public and now we'll have a better chance of, of doing that underwriting uh, if we allocate uh, this hot IPO to the officers or in some cases directors of a prospective client. 
Um, and I think it was that anonymous letter and then the cause exam that followed that ultimately resulted in some pretty important cases. Okay. Um, one, one issue that, that you, you sort of raised during your term was a conflicts of interest program. And I think you actually gave a 2003 speech suggesting that uh, conflicts of interest that, that a variety of firms under SEC's watch needed to pay much greater attention to conflicts of interest. And I wonder if you can talk a little about why you decided well, first of all, why did you decide that was an important issue to address? Yeah. I mean, I, th I think in part because of things like the IPO allocation practices, but also clearly because of uh, the research analyst stuff. And we've just seen a number of problems. And, you know, the, the, the answer didn't have to be, uh, you know, let's do it in enforcement after it happens. The answer should be from a market perspe market's perspective, let's get this cleaned up so that the, there doesn't have to be an enforcement case. You know, it's always hard to measure the effectiveness of an enforcement program. I mean, if you bring a lot of cases, well, why was there so much misconduct out there? If you're not bringing cases, are you not catching stuff? I think, I think part of the idea here was let's improve conduct so that you know, we're not constantly chasing misconduct. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, um, you know, I gave this speech encouraging uh, regulated entities to do their own review, top to bottom. You know, where do we have conflicts and how are we addressing them? And, and I don't think I expected anyway the reaction that we got, which was, uh, you know, a groundswell of we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to do it too. And Firm after firm came in and presented to not just enforcement, but also representatives of market reg and OC, here's what we did, here's what we found. Uh, and I, unfortunately, the program sort of, uh, uh, I left the agency ultimately before, before it was all completed. Um, but I, I actually thought it was time for the agency, and in particular the enforcement division, not just to use the traditional enforcement tools, you know, the penalties and the injunctions and the sanctions, but, but to use other, other uh, I think, uh, uh, tools as well, you know, including firms doing their own look. What we didn't do, and this was the challenge, this is what was challenging, I think, for, for the Wall Street firms that were doing this review. I think they weren't used to coming in and talking to enforcement about problems without getting wrapped. Okay. And, and we didn't want to make a blanket promise. You know, if you come in and tell us, no matter how bad it is, no matter what it is, we're not going to bring a case. So we left that open. We said that's not our objective here, but we're not going to give you an ironclad promise that if you bring us the equivalent of first degree murder in the securities realm, that we're not going to go about punishing you. So they weren't just bringing in, here's a new program we adopted. They were in fact bringing in problems they had identified. Issues. Let, issues. Let's put it. Let, they would. They would. They would have said at the time. Here are issues that we've identified. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. And you think so? Why do you think so many firms got on the bandwagon? I. Uh, you know. Look. Part of it may have been that other firms loudly announced that they were doing it, and they didn't want to be perceived as not doing it. I think part of it is. Look. They didn't want. They wanted to get ahead of this stuff too. I think you know that they, they had seen. Uh, you know, some pretty serious sanctions levied on them, and, and it was not pleasant. Um, and so maybe those had the deterrent effect that they had, which was, at least in this context, making these firms more amenable to, hey, let's look ourselves. I don't know. Okay. I'd like to ask about one other area that is sort of a perennial with the SEC, which is in insider trading. But it clearly waxes and wanes. There are times in which 1980s or perhaps around 2010s when a lot of attention is paid to insider trading, other where it seems to be a much smaller part of the overall enforcement portfolio. Right. Um, what happened with insider trading during your time? And, and I'll mention there was obviously a very famous case, which was the Martha Stewart case. Right. I, you know, look, I, I, it, is, it will always be, it is perennially a part of the SEC enforcement docket, as you suggest. I think, you know, sort of, Taking that as a given, it is going to ebb and flow. Part of that's going to be a function of uh, 
what's going on out there, you know, and and uh, do people remember the lessons of, you know, Boski and Milken and uh, so on and for so forth, and you know, more recently, you know, do they remember the lessons of Raj and so on and so forth? So, um, you know, I think that's that's always going to result in sort of a different level of activity that you're 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 going to go get and the other is obviously you know what are the where is the agency most focused and it will always be focused on insider trading but you know is it also focused on financial reporting is it focused in today's world on cybersecurity is it focused you know on retail investors whatever it is and and you have a finite body of resources when you're running the SEC's enforcement program. And so that's going to have an effect on uh, how many cases. So I, I would say during my tenure, it remained, you know, one of the perennials and there were a bunch of cases, but uh, it wasn't like the 80s. And it wasn't like the last few years, you know, where we've had sort of a, uh, a rise in the level of insider trading cases again. Okay. If I could ask, and I, I know we're uh, sensitive for time. But I want to ask a little about the individuals you worked with. You've already talked a little about Harvey Pitt. Yeah. Um, I, and I wanted to ask a little about Arthur Levitt and William Don. You can add more about Mr. Pitt, but about Arthur Levitt and William Donaldson as well, and the, both your interactions with them and your sense that how the chair sets a particular tone or direction for the agency. Yeah. So uh, Arthur, uh, you know, was was in probably year six of of an eight year tenure when when I came to the agency. I was the deputy, so um, you know, while I had a bunch of inter interaction with him directly, I also had a bunch of interaction through my boss, Dick Walker. Uh, he was a great chairman, um, and I would say he's one of the best managers I've ever seen. Um, I think. Uh, um, it, it didn't take more than a couple words from Arthur to, I'll use the word persuade, persuade someone that he or she should be doing something. Uh, so he, he, he was, I, I just, I would say, very effective as a manager, uh, someone who had vision. We talked about the number game, numbers game speech, uh, and, and politically very savvy. Um, but, uh, and, and I guess I should say sort of put all that in a package together with this, I, I think, sort of relentless focus on the investor. So uh, he, he was a great chairman. Uh, Bill Donaldson, uh, I worked for directly, and I, I think he was exactly the right person at the right time for the agency. I think the agency was listing some, uh, and Bill had this, you know, pull up your socks mentality. Um, he also, I'd say, was very savvy. Uh, and understood Washington quite well uh, at a time when I think that had become more important, uh, was able to, I think, get along with the rest of the commission, which uh, was something that was very important, um, focused on the right issues. Uh, and I think, look, I think both Arthur and Bill, uh, and I'm not trying to leave Harvey out, but you asked me about those bookends, mm -hmm you know, understood the value of an enforcement program uh, uh, for the SEC, uh, you know, almost instinctively, almost intuitively. Um, neither of them is a lawyer. And they, they, they brought sort of the managerial uh, and, and business acumen to running, you know, a pretty complex agency. Each of them did that, uh, I thought, uh, quite, quite extraordinarily well. Okay. What about your interaction with the other commissioners? Certainly by the time you left in 2005, there were reports that there had been increasing numbers of split votes by the commission right. uh, with various matters. I think some debates over the size of uh, penalties that had been levied by that time. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'd say that the uh, commission uh, became a little bit more acrimonious uh, in my latter years there. Um, uh, what probably uh, has has only become more so today, but 
uh, certainly you know, in the 2001 to 2005 period more than it had been 20 years ago or 10 year, uh, 20 years prior or 10 years prior when I was starting out as a lawyer. That acrimony, a lot of times sort of the fault line for it was political affiliation. Okay. And I don't think you'd seen that before. Um, and again, I think as the agency became more important politically, as it became front page news rather than just you know business page news, um, I do think there was a focus on the agency by politicians, and you know a sense that you know if you were a Democrat, here were the positions; if you were a Republican, here were the positions. There were obviously exceptions to that. I actually think uh, Bill Donaldson, in particular, was able to navigate that quite well and probably would have defied in a number of instances sort of categorization like that. Um, but I think, yeah, there was more of that, you know, in, in my latter years at the SEC, certainly. Okay. What about any other individuals at the commission? And I ask because so much attention is paid to the commissioners, the chair, perhaps people in a very high profile position like director of enforcement. Are there other individuals who really stay with you or that struck yeah. you during your time? Well, certainly, you know, the people I worked with in enforcement and uh, you know, Linda Thompson, who was my deputy and then my successor, and um, uh, the folks who headed the trial unit, David Kornblau and Peter Bresnan, and the heads of the regional offices and some of the associate directors. And uh, we talked early about, um, you know, the focus on the internet, and John Stark started that office up. And um, so there are plenty of people. Uh, in the enforcement division. I mean, you know, sometimes when I go back and think about sort of the consummate professional, um, you know, the market surveillance unit of the enforcement division was led by Joe Sella, uh, you know, who did it for years and years and years and uh, not one of these sort of celebrated, you know, the outside world didn't really know who he was, but boy, was he good. Um, uh, so, it, look, there were plenty of people. Okay. Outside the division, I would have said my closest confidant was Lori Richards, um, you know, and, and uh, we collaborated quite closely. But uh, uh, the, the two general counsels that were there when I was there, uh, actually there were three of them, uh, Harvey Goldschmidt, who then was a commissioner during my time, uh, and David Becker. Um, uh, and then Giovanni Prezioso. I mean, the, the three of them were just three spectacular lawyers. Um, and uh, uh, I probably would have gotten myself in a lot more trouble uh, without having their advice uh, on, a, on a frequent basis. Okay. So in closing, I'd like a little reflection from sort of the position you're in now. And one of the reasons I wanted to ask this is you left in 2005. And after a short period of time at a firm, you wound up at J.P. Morgan Chase for many years, mm -hmm. which, while a giant financial firm and regulated by a lot of people, certainly has plenty of units that are regulated, or several units that are regulated by the SEC. Right. Having been there over a decade, looking back, did that change your opinion of enforcement? How, what did it sort of? It, it gave, I suppose it gave you a different coming to New York, taking that position, would have given you a different perspective on what the SEC actually does? I don't think it gave me a different perspective on what the agency does. Okay. Um, or maybe it, it's impact. It, 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 uh, I think I did have a perspective on how it was doing what it did. Uh, you know, not necessarily in ways that I was always happy about uh, when I was on the receiving end of, of uh, uh, enforcement uh, inquiries and cases uh, in, in, in a couple of cases. Um, you know, what you have to remember uh, when you do this as a lawyer and you do this on the defense side as well as uh, on the enforcement side is, you know, the, the, the agency has a job to do. And, and how that job gets done does change over time. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, you know, it, 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 in fact, I would say generally it changes for the better. Um, and uh, you know, my hats are off to the people who are running the enforcement division today. Um, I think they're doing an incredibly effective job, uh, and they're not doing it exactly the way their predecessors uh, have done it, and all the more power to them. Okay. And looking back at your time, is there anything you'd identify as something you're particularly proud of? Mm. And are there any regrets? Anything that in retrospect you wish you'd done differently or been able to address? Yeah, I think, um, 
I'll address the regrets uh, piece first. Uh, you know, look, I think, you know, we were uh, thrust into a world that was um, exploding on the security side. And, you know, we've talked about Enron and WorldCom and the financial reporting uh, scandals. And then, you know, you had the, the, the research analyst stuff and, and, and the late trading stuff and the IPO spending stuff. There, 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 there wasn't enough time to be as forward-looking as I would have liked in terms of, you know, are, are we structured the right way? Are we uh, deployed the right way? Are we, um, do we have the units set up? Are we, you know, do we have the right organizational structure to, to succeed? And, you know, because I think we were just, uh, I, I think, you know, we had so much incoming uh, so that that that's one regret. Um, I think uh, uh, you know, in terms of what I'm proud of, you know, I I think we brought some incredible cases under a lot of stress and a lot of strain, um, and you know, and always did so in my mind in an incredibly professional way. And you know, it, it, while I mentioned uh, earlier in this conversation that you know, are you mindful of what's happening in the press and the criticism? I don't think we ever lost our bearings, um, and you know, we never got away from you know the the process protections that have been the hallmark of the agency. And while another you know regulator or prosecutor could go, you know, yeah, I'm bringing that case, and there's no Wells process here, and I don't have a commission. You know, we never lost sight that, that one of the strengths of the agency is, you know, all the protections it brings to bear. One of the strengths of the agency is that it isn't just about the size of the fine. It's about, you know, improving markets. And I think we always, you know, sort of hewed to that mission, uh, and I'm proud of that. Well, thank you so much for your time. We really thank you. appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure.